Loops control the flow of code, and there are only two types of loops. While loops, which we'll learn next video, and for loops, which we will look at now. Both of these loops behave very similarly, but there is a slight yet important difference in how they do so. A for loop runs code that we place inside of it over and over, and we typically use them when we know how many times we want that loop to run. That's the important distinction there on the end. They usually run for a known and predetermined amount of times. For example, let's say we wanted to flash an LED off and on five times. Here I have the code to flash it on and off once, and then here is a for loop that will execute the code inside of it five times and our LED will flash five times. So we have the for keyword followed by a variable that we will use to count through the loops, the in keyword, which is part of this for structure, followed by range five, which creates a sequence of five numbers in a row. And the result of this is that the loop will execute the code five times here. To help see what's going on here, I've created this loop that just prints the variable i as it goes through each iteration of its loop. And as you can see, it prints off 10 numbers counting up. This might not behave exactly as you think though, because this is zero indexed, meaning that it will start counting at zero and not one. So keep an eye out for that. It's just how the range function works and computers and code and software like this kind of like starting at zero when we in the real world like to start counting at one. So we can create a simple loop that runs the code inside of it for the amount of times we put in the brackets. But that variable i inside of the brackets is changing each loop and we can use that to to perform tasks iteratively. Before we dive into that, we're gonna learn how to more finely use that range function. Besides just choosing how many times it loops, we can also specify a number to start counting it by placing it at the start of the brackets like so. So here, it's gonna start counting at one and end at nine. And we do have an issue here relating to the zero indexing. The reason it doesn't print to 10, even though we've got it in the brackets here, is because this range function generates the numbers up to, but not including the number on the end. So if we wanted to count from one to 10, we would need to specify one and 11. This can be a little annoying sometimes, but it's just something we gotta get used to with MicroPython. We can also choose how much we want the loop to increase by, by placing it on the end of the brackets there. For example, this code starts at zero, ends at 100 or 99 technically, and counts by eight every single loop. Now we're equipped to use loops in a bread and butter application called a servo sweep. Let's say we wanted to use a servo and we set it to zero degrees and then 180 degrees. When we do this, the servo will rotate as fast as it can between those two positions. But what if we wanted to control how fast it rotates or maybe try and make that motion a little bit smoother? Well, that's what we're going to do by changing the angle of the servo bit by bit with a for loop. Here's the sample code for that and it can be found on our course page on our website link in the description for our YouTube audience. We will be using the MicroPython servo library, so you will need that installed if you haven't already done so. And you'll need to connect your nine gram servo to your Pico with the signal wire in GPIO zero and powering it off of VBus. So here we are using a for loop with a bit of a modified range. We're going to start at zero degrees and go all the way to 180 degrees, taking steps of five. So zero, five, 10, 15. Then in the for loop, we use the variable which we called angle and use it to set the angle on the servo. And then we've just got a quick sleep every cycle to help control the speed of the rotation. And then once that loop has finished counting to 180, we have another one that starts at 180 and goes to zero in steps of negative five. It's just the exact same, but in reverse. And if we rotate it, you can see that the servo sweeps from one side to the other in a somewhat of a controlled fashion here. This is a bit rough though, and could definitely do with some improvements. So if you wanted something to do, you could play around and you could make it smoother by reducing the step size and playing around with the sleep time to get some buttery smooth rotation. Just remember that the range function can only take a whole integer, meaning you can't use numbers with decimal points. You, you can't tell it to rotate by 0.1 of a degree. 
And this application of creating smooth motions with for loops is a really powerful tool and is great for anything PWM related. For example, this RGB LED is using for loops to cycle through all of its colors nice and smoothly. We're gonna quickly go over lists, well, because they're important to learn, but they're also a powerful tool when paired with for loops. Lists are a data structure that let you store a collection of variables inside of it like a list. Here I'm creating a list called test lists and as you can see you can just add elements to it by separating them with a comma and you can store any type of variable in it here I've got a string an integer and a float all in one list to access an element inside the list you can do so with the list name and then put the element you want to retrieve in the square brackets like so just be aware that lists are also zero indexed meaning that when I say I want element zero like I'm doing so here it's going to print the first one in the list. If I wanted the third number here, one, three, four, four, I would need to say, I want the second element of it. That's because we start counting at zero. And it's a similar process to change an element in a list. Here, I'm gonna set the second element to 13. And if I run it, you can see that it's no longer 1344. Lists are a really great tool and there are many ways to use them, but they pair really well with for loops. Here, I am defining a list and then instead of using the range function in my for loop, I am instead cycling through the list. And if we see that, you can see that it prints every single element that's in that list. We have six elements in our list, so it loops six times and I is iteratively changed to each element in that list. And this is really powerful because maybe you want your Pico to count through a series of strings instead of numbers, or maybe you want it to count through a set of numbers that you can't make with the range function. Whatever you want to count through, you can use lists to manually do so. All right, three key takeaways. One, for loops typically run for a known or predetermined amount of times. Two, you can use the range function to control how many times that for loop is going to loop, or you can get a bit more involved and specify the start, end point, and step size. And three, if you don't want to use range in your for loop, you can use a list, which allows you to store a collection of variables inside of it.